forward. Good. All right. Well, hello. Now, today I'm here. I've got Kim, but it's the very first of our new Can Do Gold um, meetings, and I'm really pleased to be back, and I'm sure you are. Um, this is Tuesday, the 7th of um, February, 2023. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through module one. I'm sharing my screen so that those of you that are new around here, you can have a look and I'll show you how to find module one. And I'll just have a brief chat about each of the lessons in module one. And um, then we're going to see if anybody else arrives. And if not, if Kim has any questions she'd like answered. If you can't catch this, there is another meeting, um, Brisbane time, 7 a.m. on Friday, which I know is a better time for a lot of Aussies. Um, but um, if you can't make that either and you have a question, just let me know. Uh, you can reply in the comments here or you can email me or anything and um, I'll certainly get onto that quickly. Otherwise, um, make sure you have joined the private Facebook group. And if you're not a Facebook fan, I know some people aren't, don't worry, you're not going to miss anything because everything is here and you can always comment to me inside the training itself. I answer those comments really quickly um, or you can flick me an email if you have something you want to discuss. So once you get onto the site and you go along to my courses, then you click on the gold course because that is what we're in today. So you might have other courses, you might not. If you click on the gold course, that will take you to here. So in the welcome module there's just a few things about goal setting now, i really encourage you to set some goals and each time we do this so each time i open registration and i'm going to be doing this in the future about three times a year and each time we do that we're going to bring the goal meetings back for 10 weeks and we're going to go through it like this one module a week and so it gives you an opportunity each time we do that together as a group to set some more goals so see how you went with the last goals you set and then consider setting yourself some more goals. So that will help you there in the just the, um, the very first welcome module there, just to give you a little bit of an idea about how to navigate the training and to set yourself some goals. So then you'll, you'll come back to this page and today we're going to look at module one. So just click into module one. And this is all you'll have available. If you just join, this is all you'll have available because I'm only giving you one module a week for the first 10 weeks, um, apart from the bonus material, which was the young horse module and the off the track module. So the reason I give you one a week is because there's a lot of content in the Can Do Gold course and it can be quite overwhelming and I really don't want you to get overwhelmed because I don't like it when people get overwhelmed. So I'm not expecting you to keep up with this rate of doing one module a week. That's not the expectation at all. The expectation is to give you a feel for where you're going with it, okay? So we'll look at the um, engagements I only give to the bit tonight, but you might not get to the give to the bit for another week or two. The next week, we're going to look at shoulder control. You might not get to shoulder control for three weeks. So this is why you've got um, access forever, because it, it takes some people longer. We have Some people have more time. And I know that some people just come in, they just really want to do flying changes. But the problem is that you've got to get that foundation first. Everything builds on the lesson before it. And the most important lessons I think are in this module one. The reason I believe that is because the first part of the module is all about the engagement zone. So that is really getting your horse ready to learn. It's getting your horse's emotional level in that really nice place that I call the engagement zone where the horse is a little bit more alert than it would be if it was standing around in a paddock, but not so alert as to be afraid or not so aroused as to be afraid or trying to escape. So it's that, it's that really place where that horse is really engaged with you and thinking about you and enjoying the training, but still able to relax. You know, it's that place where the horse is looking for answers. So it's really important. I think that the engagement zone is probably the most 
overlooked aspect of training. So when things go wrong, I think things basically started going wrong because the emotional level of the horse was wrong. And so that's why in this first one here, you know, assessing your horse's emotional level is really, really important. Learning how to assess it. What is it? You know, what's the first thing that happens when the horse gets too emotional? And, you know, we, we think about um, things that tell us the horse's emotional. The horse might be vocalising, for example, that will mean it's emotional. The horse might be galloping up and down the fence line. That means the horse is emotional. But what's the very first thing that happens? The horse raises its head. Now, head elevation is always the first thing that happens. And so we need to be able to assess that. We need to be able to assess the horse emotional level um, very fast and know when we're pushing the horse too far. Now, when we talk about the engagement zone, I want the horse more emotional than it was when it was resting in the paddock. Okay, so what we need to learn to do, and this is what this bunch will teach us, is learn to increase the horse's emotional level because what we can't do is just lower it. You know, it's impossible for us to force the horse to relax. The only thing we can do is we can increase it. So I can make the horse move, for example. I can make the horse more emotional. The quickest way to do that is to get it to move. It doesn't have to move fast, but to get it to move, that's the quickest way to increase its emotional level. But I can't force it to stop moving. So I've got to work with what I can get the horse to do. I could force it to stop moving if I use punishment, for example, but I don't want to use punishment. I want to use reinforcement. So I, I'm going to get the horse to move. I'm going to increase the horse emotional level, and then I'm going to offer the horse the opportunity to relax and bring it down again. And that's how we learn to increase and lower the horse's emotional level. We increase it, then we offer it the opportunity to relax a bit and bring it down again. And eventually, so I'll get you in this very first module, judging your horse's emotional level out of 100. And eventually, what we're going to be able to do is push the horse's emotional level up 1 or 2%. So when I say to you, you know, increase the horse emotional level a bit, and I know, Kim, that we've done this with some of the videos that you've sent in of mm -hmm. doing Give to the Bit. And I think the first one that you sent in, the horse was just not emotional enough. Like she just wasn't involved. And, you know, she was looking, she was quite blown. She was looking around mm -hmm. and she was just, there wasn't enough energy in there. So it wasn't interesting enough for her. And as soon as you change that, you could see that sort of bubble forming around the horse. And now she's going, oh, okay, this is quite interesting. What does Kim want me to do now? And suddenly we we're having a conversation, whereas before you were just two separate entities wandering around the paddock. So it is a really important thing. And the only way we learn how to lower the horse's emotional level is by learning to raise it and, and learning to actually manipulate that emotional level a bit. So that's what we're doing in those first two sessions there. The third one is a shaping behavior. And really everything that we do with the horse is about shaping behavior. You know, there's an old cowboy saying, you start with your goal, end in a wreck. And, and it's absolutely true. You know, so it's like the people that come to me and say, I just want to learn flying changes. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's great. That's great. Your horse could probably do flying changes in the paddock, but, you know, unless we put a cue on that, then the horse isn't going to know what you're asking. And the flying change is quite a complicated cue because you have to learn to keep the shoulders still and move the hindquarters independently to get the flying change. So it's if you start with wanting the horse to flying change and don't put the foundation work in there, what you're going to get is a horse that only changes in front, won't change behind. Is a flying change, like the canter comes from the back end of the horse, so you need to actually move the back end, not the front end. And we see that sort of thing a lot, you know, um, especially with flying changes where people go out and they just try and teach that movement and they haven't got independent control of the hindquarters, so it can't actually be done. So the horse just throws its shoulders over. Another one that um, is a really good example of shaping behaviour is trailer loading. And, you know, we teach it here, one foot on, one foot off, and, um, and that shapes the behaviour. So you don't ask the horse to get all the way onto the trailer the first time. I'm not interested in taking the horse anywhere. I'm interested in the horse learning to step forward and backward when asked to do so. That's all I want to teach the horse. Um, so again, it's a really good example of 
of shaping behavior. Number four here is, have I got pressure? And it's a really interesting one. And I remember the first day when we were sitting around at John Lyons' place and it was 15 people all sitting on their horses and he was chatting away. And he said, it's really interesting looking around here because half of you are holding on to your horse like with some pressure and the other half had just dropped the reins and you're just sort of sitting there and not touching the horse at all. Um, and it was it was very interesting because if you start to look around at, at riders and things, you let's say you're out on a hack and you stop for a chat. Some riders will just drop their reins. Others will hold a contact on the horse the whole time. And the problem is, if you're holding a contact on the horse, you've got pressure. Every time you have pressure, you want to be able to release that when the horse does the right thing. So every time we hold pressure without trying to change something without asking for something to change and don't release it, it's unrelenting pressure. And so we're actually desensitizing the horse and making it less sensitive to our signals and um, potentially confusing the horse. So it's a, it's a really interesting thing when we start to really think about pressure. So even if you're leading your horse from the paddock to the stable, you know, ask yourself all the time, have I got pressure on this horse? You know, am I clucking at the horse on the lunge? Is the horse already trotting? Am I still clucking at the horse and the horse is trotting? And if you are, then you've got pressure on the horse because your clucking noise is pressure. So ask yourself with that pressure, what am I trying to change? And the thing to do then is to increase the pressure if you need to, to get the change and then stop clucking. So if we think about the different types of pressure, the voice is a really good one. It's a very overlooked one. You often see a horse on a lunge line, for example, and the, the trainer is, is clucking it the whole time, but it's already trotting. So if you want it to trot faster, then cluck at it until it trots faster and then stop. It's got to be pressure release. So if you don't know that you've got pressure, then you're not really sure if, when to release it. So we need to be thinking about that. My, my whole, when I'm leading the horse, am I holding pressure on the leg round? Have I got pole pressure on the head collar? If so, what am I trying to change? And I need to release it when I've changed that. And the more aware we are of that, the quicker the horse learns about combined reinforcement. Because if we're really clear, then the horse understands it much more easily. I used to use a, an example. Um, when I had a clinic and I'd ask for a volunteer and I'd just walk around the arena with them next to them and, and talk with them. And I'd you know, say, is that all right? You, you're quite comfortable doing that? And they'd go, yeah, sure. And I'd, ask, I'd do the same circle with them, but hold their hand just gently. And um, they, they were sort of okay with that. Not, not so much, really. <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> but most of them were okay with that. And then I'd do the same thing. I'd hold their hand quite tight. Um, and they were not liking this by this stage. Um, then when I held their hand quite tight and then just occasionally jabbed them in the side for no particular reason, they really didn't like that. It became quite dangerous exercise for me. But we need to think about that, you know, from the horse's perspective. Um, what is it that we're getting the horse to do and how comfortable is the horse likely to be with that? I really think it's important that we know where the pressure is coming from and where the release comes in. What is it we're trying to change? Um, number five is practice makes perfect. And well, I don't think that's true. And I think that we have over the years um, done way too many repetitions for horses. I think they're much cleverer than we give them credit for. I think perfect practice makes perfect, but I think we probably need to do a lot less than we thought because I think we get quite boring. In number six, I'm just talking about the four basic training principles, that spot, direction, motivated, reward. And if anything we teach, if we can think about those four things, we can be really clear for the horse. So the spot is just the spot on the horse we want to move. And I don't think it matters what you're teaching, whether it's to do a flying change or to load on a trailer. You can always bring it down to one spot. Um, so for the trailer, I'd have the left front foot. The direction I want that to go is forwards and backwards. The motivator, I'm going to use um, um, whip pressure on the heart, on the hip, and tap on the hip with the whip. 
and the reward, so I'm going to let the horse rest and I'm going to stroke the horse and tell the horse he's wonderful. So that spot, direction, motivator, reward. So what we can't do is skip the motivator and the motivator, we need to remember that's the pressure and release. So it's the negative reinforcement section. So it needs to be just the pressure and the release. It goes together. The reward, we need to add. So the reward is not the release. The release comes with the pressure, that's it, that go together. We need to add the reward. So I added, in this case, I added the scratch on the wither, I added the kind word, I added the rest. These things are the positive reinforcement. We need to use the combination of the two. Number seven just discusses the International Society for Equitation Science training principles. They actually, um, in 2018, I think they redeveloped them, made them 10 instead of eight. I frankly prefer the eight. They're just more user-friendly. So you'll find as you work through this material that every lesson is broken down into those eight ISIS training principles, and that, that's quite useful. Um, then we look a little bit at an anxious horse. And if you click more at the end of each of these things, it will take you probably to a second page. Um, and then I've got a couple of things about teaching relaxation and raising and lowering the emotional level. So I'm just going to go back to the categories. So the second part of module one is really where we get into the training. So here, with each of these um, big modules, you'll find a, a full-length training lesson. And these are just DVDs that I made some years ago. And it's really interesting that the information is still exactly the same. So they, they usually go for 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and then from here, you can click on all the, all the other um, lessons, which are much shorter, and they just break it down for you to, to make it a little bit easier. Um, so there's a few things here, teaching bridling. Bridling is often a difficult thing, so we go through that, um, how to teach bridling. We talk a lot more about pressure and the horses, what, where the horse's head position should be, where you should be. The off the track you'll have in your bonus material, a whole off the track. Um, module and if you have an off the track course I advise you to watch those at the same sort of time um, you can see some off the track horses there I love this lesson for off the track horses because you know, they have these real light bulb moments and go oh my god you're, all the pressure goes away you're joking that's great and they really engage it's really lovely to see but what you might find is you know you have to remember with teach give to the bit that your motivator is the pressure so you pick up pressure. Now, if a horse has never had a ride along before and you pick up pressure on one rein, that horse is going to start moving. This horse is going to look for answers. What do I do to get rid of this? Um, and then it's pretty fast to teach that horse that. It goes, oh, okay, I'll move my head this way. It all goes away. Oh, that's wonderful. And you give me a pat. That's great. Now, the racehorse, on the other hand, or the dressage schoolmaster, on the other hand, has spent a lot of time with some unrelenting pressure, so meaningless pressure that never goes away, no matter what the horse does. So it can hold its head like this horse behind me here, um, and the pressure is still there. It can do anything, and the pressure just never goes away. And if a dressage horse, for example, it might put its head down, might be in a nice frame, but the rider will pick up a good contact, and then again we're back to that unrelenting pressure thing. So if you these two horses, the unbroken horse and the, the off-the-track horse, they have very different pressure requirements or very different motivation requirements. If you have a horse that's been used to unrelenting pressure, you're going to need to use much more than the horse that's never felt any pressure. It doesn't mean you need to keep using it. You use it, you get that response, and you release everything. And the horse goes, oh, don't know what happened there. You pick it up again, enough to get the horse to change. You have to motivate the horse to change. And the horse gives the bit, you release it, you scratch the horse, and very quickly the horse goes, oh, wow, okay, I feel the pressure, but it goes away when I move my head in a certain way. And that's, that's the connection that we're looking for. So those off-the-track horses are, are really great. Um, they love that lesson because it's really nice to see them um, 
understand that they have some sort of control and they're being engaged in the learning process. Um, there's a little one here, we're sort of writing it to the bit, so it's taught on the ground, like pretty much everything we teach, we teach it on the ground if we can first, and then transfer that to the saddle. If you've got a horse that's not yet started and you're desperately waiting for module three, I think it is where it first rides, then you don't need to do that yet, do that later. Um, and I get asked a lot of questions about which bit is best. And I'm a very simple person. I like to understand exactly what's happening in my horse's mouth. So I'm not very good with mile bits or expensive bits or anything like that. I like um, a snaffle with a, with a flat lozenge. I like the reins to work independently. Um, I don't like bits that can do nutcrackers, but I get a bit confused when they all swivel and and carry on. So I find a nice simple bit. 